اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان العین الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین والحمد للہ الذي جعلنا من المتمسکین بولایت امیر المؤمنین ولیمت المعصومین علیہم السلام والحمد للہ الذي هدانا لہذا وما کنا لنہتدی لولان هدان اللہ ثم الصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبیاء والمرسلین خاتم النبیین شفیع المذنبین حبیب الہ العالمین بالقاسم المصطفی محمد اللہ وعلى آل بیتہ الطیبین الطاہرین المعصومین ولعنت اللہ على اعدائہم اجمعین من يوم عداوتهم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الحكيم وهو أصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولتكم منكم أمة يدعون إلى الخير ويأمرون بالمعروف وينهون عن المنكر وأولئك هم المفلحون آمنا باللہ صدق اللہ العلی العظیم صلی علی محمد و آلی محمد اما بعد السلام علیکم جمیعا و رحمت اللہ و برکاتم I begin in the name of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala there is no doubt that it's due to his kindness and generosity that he gives us these opportunities where we gather in remembrance and in glorification of Him, Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. Then we send our heartfelt condolences to our 12th and living Imam, Imam Al-Hujjah, Ajal Allahu Ta'ala, Farajahu Sharif. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali. And to each and every one of you as we gather this evening to commemorate the istishhad anniversary of our 6th Imam, Imam Ja'far As-Sadiq, alayhi afdalu salatu wa salam. اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد. We pray to Allah تبارك وتعالى that we each get an opportunity to go for the ziyarat of our Imam in Medina, and that we receive his shafaat in the hereafter, insha Allah. Our Imam عليه السلام was born on the 17th of Rabiul Awal, which of course, as we know, is also the birth date of our beloved Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his family. And so when he comes around to the 17th of Rabi Al-Awwal, it becomes very hard for the speaker to, to spend 45 minutes, if we're lucky, uh, to dedicate uh, this entire program or that entire program towards two such great personalities like the Prophet and Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. Um, and so we, we focus on his life during this night in particular and to see the type of legacy um, that he left behind. There is no doubt, right, that the Imam alayhi salam has left such a tremendous legacy that we are proud to be known as Ja'fari. Yeah, this name that we attributed ourselves towards comes from him because of the work that he did, because of the, the groundwork actually that he laid, um, which allowed great civilizations and knowledge and wisdom and, and every type of intellectual movement and ideological movement to be solidified during that time which can then clearly indicate where our allegiance is and to whom our allegiance is. The reason our Imam salam was afforded such an opportunity, an opportunity that not other Imams got, right? Um, the only two Imams we know who had this opportunity to really establish the groundwork was his father, our fifth Imam, and our sixth Imam, alayhima afdalu salatu wa salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And the reason for this opportunity, as we've all heard so many times, is because of um, his imamat, 34 years, um, coincided with the downfall of the Umayyad dynasty and the rise of the Abbasid dynasty. Out of these 34 years, the Imam salam spent 17 or 18 of these years under the, the rulership of the Umayyad dynasty. 
And in that 17 years, there were five different Umayyad rulers who came and went um, because of the turmoil that existed within themselves. And at this time, then you see the decline of the Umayyad dynasty and the rise of the Abbasid dynasty, which the Imam salam spent nearly 15 or 16 years under. So in these 34 years, because of the political situation that existed, the Imam salam was able to do a lot more and lay this groundwork um, that we truly benefit from today because the, the politicians were busy, right? Those in power were busy making sure that they were able to keep that power that they were so hungry for. And so you see that during these 34 years of the Imam alayhi salam, he was able to do things like establish learning centers, right? What we would call today universities, right? Where people would come from far and wide just so that they get an opportunity to sit with the Imam, learn from the Imam, and then go back to their communities and give back whatever that, that they learned from that Imam alayhi salam. According to certain reports, you see that nearly 4,000 students came to study from the Imam alayhi salam. This at that time, if you imagine, right? At that time, it's not like today. Today, we still tip our hats to people, for example, who travel from here to Qum or from people who travel from here to Najaf for Islamic studies. Um, but yet, you know, this journey at the max, maybe what, like 20 hours, right, by plane. You get there and you're, you're set. But these people, for example, who would want to come from Basra or want to come from Kufa or want to come from Sham or from Iran, these are people who would travel for months just to come and have an audience with the Imam, sit with the Imam. And I think that tells us as well the thirst that existed at that time for knowledge. And the Imam alayhi salam was there to provide this knowledge. So this is one of the tremendous legacies that he has left behind. And from that, um, we get this tremendous treasure of hadith literature of hadith material that we get from our Imam alayhi salam in particular, nearly more than any other Imam, you find that the sixth Imam alayhi salam um, and the fifth Imam, we have to give credit to both of these Imams, the amount of hadith and guidance that we get from there far exceeds all of the other Imams if we were to even put them together as far as the material is concerned. And so you see that the outcome of wanting to establish this learning system was that till today we benefit from that, from all subjects, whether we're talking about theological subjects, we're talking about jurisprudential subjects, we're talking about akhlaqi subjects, and it doesn't even end there, right? You can go towards the sciences and see the, the great... Um, uh, the gift of the Imam alayhi salam in what he was able to give and through all that, right? So I think these are all connected, it's very interesting. So through all that, the Imam alayhi salam was able to safeguard um, the true teachings and the true message of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And this was probably the most important thing. Right? That this was the time when the different madhahib were taking shape. Right? Because of that interest in knowledge, there were now people who were coming about um, with different ideologies, with different ideas about how Islam should be practiced. Really kind of not different than where we are today, you know, if you think about it. Right? Today, mashallah, there's a great amount of people who have interest in Islam. That is why you go and you see how many people have traveled to the centers of Islamic knowledge, right? Like I think I'm lowballing this figure, but from what I last heard, there were over 150 Western students studying in Qum. And I'm lowballing this figure, I think, right? I think it could be even higher. 150, imagine. And that's a lot, right? I mean, you can come back and have three Maulanas in every center in the West and you'd be covered, right? Um, and so there's a great interest in Islamic knowledge. But at the same time, today we find many scholars coming out with their own interpretations of how Islam should be practiced. Right? Very similar, I think, to what, what existed in the time of the sixth Imam alayhi salam. Right? And so this is where I come to a very important point, that if we want to look at the legacy of the Imam, if we want to understand what the Imam's main base was from which he worked so that we can establish a similar base from which we can work um, to have the, inshallah, the same outcome that the sixth Imam did, 
when you focus on this base or when you focus on all of these three things that I talked about, establishing learning centers, uh, leaving a legacy of literature and hadith, and at the same time safeguarding the true and pristine message of the Prophet, you see that the base that which the Imam salam was working from was the base of Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahi Anil Munkar. Right? The base of enjoining the good and forbidding the evil. Right? Now we all know these are wajibats. Yeah? They come so far down the list that sometimes we forget that they are wajibat. You know, we get busy with namaz, roza, hajj, zakat, khu- I'm out of breath. Yeah? And we forget about Amr bin no, bil Ma'roof and Nahi Anil Munkar are wajibats. Right? These are in fact some of the main wajibas. And really, if we were to analyze what the Imam salam did, he taught and guided people towards good. Right? And he was teaching and guiding people to forbid them from evil. This is part of Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahi Anil Munkar. Sometimes, you know, we have translated Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahi Anil Munkar as scolding people. Like that's what it is. You got to scold people. That's how you do it. No, but when, for example, you go and teach in the madrasa, you are literally doing Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahi Anil Munkar. Right? When you wake your family up for Salatul Fajr, you are literally doing Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahi Anil Munkar. Right? Uh, if somebody is doing something like wudu incorrectly and you politely tell them, that is doing Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahi Anil Munkar. It is not that you have to stand on a pulpit and scold people and label people to be able to do Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahi Anil Munkar correctly. It can be done in numerous ways. And when you look at the Imam, the way he targeted it, he wanted to teach people because he recognized that he lived in a time when a lot of false ideologies were creeping into Islam. A lot of ideologies that were not what was originally taught by the Prophet were now being done in Islam. So he had to bring about a message that made it clear to the people what the true message of the Prophet was so that they themselves could apply the teachings of Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahi Anil Munkar in their own lives. Right? You didn't need the Imam to tell you that this is right and this is wrong. He provided you the framework, he provided you the teachings, he provided you the guidelines, and then you yourself can apply those in your own life so that you are carrying out the wajibats for yourself. And not just that, he made it clear what the right way of teaching was and what the right way of practicing Islam was so that generations and generations down the line people like you and I can apply Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahi Anil Munkar based on what was taught to us by our Aimma alayhim wasalam. Right? You see the very beautiful connection that exists in what the base and the foundation of the Imam alayhi salam was. And this is not unknown to us. This is not something that should be mind-boggling to us. In fact, when we study the legacy of every prophet that came, of every imam that came, of every pious person that ever stood for Islam and came, they based their actions on Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahi Anil Munkar. This is why we talk about it so much. This is why we repeat it so much. Because everyone who wants to be successful needs to base their conduct on the two wajibats of Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahi Anil Munkar. Our fifth Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam. Muhammad. He says in a tradition, Inna al-Amr bil Ma'roof wa naha Anil Munkar sabilu al-Anbiya wa minhaju al-Sulaha yeah. He says that Amr bil Ma'roof in joining the good and forbidding the evil or the wrong path is the path of the prophets and the way of the righteous and a great obligation, Faridatun Azima, a great obligation on which all other obligations are founded upon. Subhanallah on which every other obligation is founded upon. Therefore, when I, for example, tell myself, okay, it's time for salah, you need to go and pray, and no, there's a nice game on, but no, I go pray and I'm having this battle right, in my mind, and I convince myself, no, Baba, go and pray, I have just done Amr bil Ma'roof for myself. I have just done Nahi Anil Munkar on myself. It's not that necessarily I have to do it for others, right? But it is an obligation on which all other obligations are based on. 
And therefore what that means is that whenever I fulfill any other obligation, the base of that obligation was Amra bil ma'roof and nahi anil munkar. Beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful, right? And sometimes we don't realize this, right? That this is how Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahi Anil Munkar serve um, as a base. And so when we look at the legacy of the Imam alayhi salam, I think this is the one area that I want to focus on today. Um, is that obligation of basing all our ideologies and all of our actions and all of our thoughts around these two obligations of enjoining the good and forbidding the evil. So how do we do that, right? I, how do I base everything? Because imagine, right, like if I was actually conscious, conscious about fulfilling my obligations of Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahi Anil Munkar, it would mean that I would literally never sin. Literally, right? Because if I truly concentrated on that obligation, I wouldn't allow myself to do an evil because I would prohibit myself from doing evil. The reason why we get carried away with something which is not allowed is because I didn't focus on the fact that of basing my obligations or, or basing it on Amr bil Ma. Are you all with me? Yeah? Some of you all drove from far from the east. Don't get tired on me. Yeah? Um, you understand what I'm saying, right? So when we understand this, then the idea is that how do we do that? How do we base all of our obligations or all of our ideologies and all of our actions on these two obligations? It starts with us as individuals. It really does. Right? It starts with me as an individual. It requires a sense of purity. We come to a tradition from our sixth Imam, As Sadiq alayhi salam. Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. He said, Hasbul mu'min izzan idha ra'a munkaran an ya'lam Allah azza wa jal min qalbihi in karahu. He says, it is an honor indeed for a believer. Listen to this, right? It is an honor indeed for a believer that when he sees or she sees munkar, wrong, evil, indecency with their eyes or they're being done, that Allah knows that in their heart they have rejected it. It is an honor for a believer. Yeah? It is an honor for a believer that when they see evil happening, that Allah knows that in their heart that person has rejected it, right? Therefore, when I see something haram taking place, even if I don't have the ability to verbal, verbalize something, I don't have the ability to physically do something, right? Um, but in my heart, I said, man, this is wrong. Right? I feel sick to the pit of my stomach that this is happening, right? Um, and this is something that should exist for all of us. Now the problem is, right, is that we have over time become desensitized to these things, right? So for example, every, every, uh, every show, literally, right, that I watch on TV, commercials that are there on TV, people are drinking, yeah, people not dressed appropriately are going out and, and so, in my mind, after having seen that one time, 10 times, 15 times, 20 times, 30 times, um, I don't see it as a big deal anymore. People are drinking. I'm not drinking, Baba. Yeah? But people are drinking. And what's happened is that the very base of what is expected of us as believers has become eroded. Yeah? It's become corrupted. What is the expectation, right? Is that, for example, when I see something haram, like the drinking of alcohol on TV, it should annoy me, at the very least. It should upset me that, ah, uh, how can something haram be happening, right? But it isn't, right? Because why we have become desensitized to this? This is part of the, the, the insaniyat of human beings, right? Or the ruhaniyat, you can say, the spirit of the soul. When the ulama of the nafs, they say that the human being has a soul that after it has consistently been, um, it consistently sees things, it, does, it becomes desensitized to it. You know, we've given so many examples of this in the past, right? That now even what's happening like in Iraq or in Syria and all this death doesn't even bother me as much as it should. Why? Because I become desensitized to it, right? It's the way human beings are. Well, the same thing applies when it comes to the 
things which are haram. If I am exposed to it over and over and over again, I'm, I don't see it as a big deal anymore, right? And so like you see, this is really interesting about media, if you pay attention to media, right? How media has systematically told us who we should like and who we should not like. So for example, it started after World War II where you would see movies now coming out sympathizing with the Jews, right? And of course, right, whenever innocent people have been killed, we should sympathize with them. But the media specifically targeted that so that eventually anyone who says anything against a Jew is an anti-Semite. It, it went to that extent, right? And then the next people the media specifically targeted were who? Yeah? People who are homosexual, right? That today you have shows and shows on TV promoting it and promoting it to where it's not a big deal. And on the, on the opposite side, this is why the media has purposely kept Muslims always as terrorists. Yeah? How they purposely kept Muslims always as uh, shopkeepers and 7-Eleven store owners so that you will never see them as an insan. Right? But if you see, for example, somebody who is an insan, they laugh, they cry, they joke, you automatically begin to sympathize with that person. Right? And this is a very specific target that the media has laid out, something that I think all of us are aware of, um, but something that needs to be reminded time and time again that there is a specific agenda that, will have, that happens. And this is why you know, we have to be really careful of what we allow our children to watch, what we allow ourselves to watch. Let's not kid ourselves, we're getting affected too, right? But what we watch on TV, what we hear on the radio, all of these things have an effect on it. So when you look at our lives, or when you look at this expectation of Amr bil ma'roof and nahi anil munkar, the, ulti the base or the, the minimum bar that is expected is that we, when we see this taking place, it should affect us. It should upset us. And to be very honest, I don't think we're there all the time. Yeah? I don't think we're there all the time. There are certain things that have happened that alhamdulillah, majority, I don't even say all, majority of the people have said, whoa, Baba, this is too far. Yeah? There are certain things that have happened which certain people said this is too far. Alhamdulillah for that. I was pleased to see that there exists some morality within us. Right? But there are other things that have happened in our communities. There are other things that have happened in our day and age which we have just taken for granted and we allow that to be a norm in our life and that, my brothers and sisters, is not acceptable in Islam. It isn't, right? This is something, Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. I want everybody to pay attention to what I'm about to say, okay? Um, there are people constantly coming in, it's distracting everybody. Can everybody just move forward? I have very limited time today, unfortunately. Yeah? And I have something very important to say. Salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Our current situation that we are facing today as a community, our current um, trials that we are facing today in our generation in particular, right, did not appear in a vacuum. Okay? Listen to what I'm saying. These next five minutes are crucial. Okay? Our current situation that we are facing ourselves in today, the trials of our generation did not appear out of a vacuum. Yeah, and they didn't just appear randomly and you're like, whoa, Baba, what happened? No, they have been developing to the stage over time. There have been a series of events that have happened within our communities. And when I say our community, it's not only the Khoja community, the Shia community, the Islamic Ummah, right? mankind as a whole, right? But we're more concerned about ourselves today. Yeah? The lovers of the Ahlul Bayt is who I'm referring to here. Yeah? The events and the trials that we are facing today did not appear out of a vacuum. There were a series of events that took place that if we at that time had done Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahi Anil Munkar, we would not be where we are today. Yeah? I'm being very honest. Right? I'm being very honest. People say, why do you keep talking about Amr? Because if we had talked about it then, we wouldn't be here today. Yeah? If we had done it then, we wouldn't be here today. But we didn't. Yeah? We remained silent. 
My brothers and sisters, when mixed gatherings first took place in our community, yeah, they say back in the 80s, yeah, and then our original Ajdaduna when they were here, when they first started having mixed gatherings, yeah, there was an uproar, they told me. I wasn't here. But nothing was done about it. Yeah? It became normalized. Right? Why? Why did it become normalized? We'll talk about that. Why? Yeah? And then we started having music at our weddings. Yeah? Then we started having dancing at our weddings. Yeah? We have seen certain quote-unquote Ithna Ashari weddings where alcohol is even present. Yeah? Yeah, you all don't act surprised. Yeah, we've seen the photos. Yeah? You know why these things happen? You know why these things continue? Because we attend these weddings. Yeah? Because we participate in these weddings. Yeah? And then we're crying today. By God, it's because we were quiet then that we see where we are today. Yeah? Because we attend these weddings. If the believers today, all of them, and we're in wedding season right now, full swing. I've had an invitation delivered to me. He said, Maulana, come at 6.30 because 7.30 music is starting. Yeah? Why? And we're going to attend these weddings. Why? Because we are more afraid of upsetting mankind than we are of upsetting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? We are more afraid that, ah, this guy is a buzurg. This guy is a money maker. Yeah? This guy is an influential person. This guy is my friend. Who cares about that on the day of judgment? By God, who cares about that on the day of judgment? Yeah? If we, my brothers and sisters, say, No, I am not attending these weddings. Do you really think that these type of weddings would continue today? No, they wouldn't. Yeah? It's our fault. Yeah? Who are we going to look at? It's our fault. And then we pray to Allah, Ya Allah! And our du'as are not being answered. Yeah? Our du'as are not being answered. From Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. He says, إِذَا لَمْ إِذَا لَمْ يَأْمُرُوا بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَلَمْ يَنْهَوْ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ If we or you do not do amra bil ma'roof and do not do nahi anil munkar وَلَمْ يَتَّبِئُوا الْأَخْيَارِ مِنْ أَهْلِ بَيْتِ And if you do not follow the chosen ones from my family, the Prophet is saying this. Yeah? What we are doing today, is that following the sunnah of the Prophet? Yeah? Think about it. Yeah? When we have these type of weddings, and I'm, I'm limiting it to weddings, but this, this extends to everything in life. Yeah? Everything in life. Right? At one time it was common, it was uncommon to see people without hijab come to mosque. Now the Baba, everyone's coming. Yeah? They don't even dare to put a hijab on, they just come. Yeah? That hishmat is not there, that respect is not there, nothing is there anymore. We've lost it. Yeah? We've lost it. Why? Because we never stopped it when we first saw it happening. Yeah? This starts with our kids, it starts with our youth, it starts with our... It goes on and on. Yeah? It goes on and on. The Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his family, said that if you do not do Amr bil Ma'roof, and if you do not do Nahi Anil Munkar, and if you do not follow the chosen ones from my progeny, Sallatallahu Alayhim Shiraruhum, the worst of them will govern over them. Yeah? Subhanallah. Look at our leadership today. Yeah? I'm not, again, expand your mind from the Kojanis. Yeah? But in general, Look at the leaders that we have today in the Muslim world. Yeah? Corrupt, bankrupt, liberal. Yeah? Willing to make a deal with anybody to get ahead. Sallatallahu alayhim shiraruhum fayadu'u khiyaruhum fala yustajaba lahum. That the worst of them will govern them and then when the best of them pray to God, their du'as will not be answered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The best of their du'as will know why. Because when it was time to do Amr bil Ma'roof, you didn't. Yeah? We are reacting only. We are not being proactive. We are reacting. Right? And in this reaction, there is khair, there is goodness that we have at least reacted. Like I said, in many conversation with ulama, we thank God that there existed at least some morality in us still. That we weren't willing to accept anything and everything that comes our way. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. But we have to reel it back in. Yeah? We have to reel it back in, right? Because if we don't, I swear to you, what happened will continue to happen. 
and it will become normalized. Yeah? And we will now become completely lost. Right? Completely lost. Where everything, everything haram has become halal. Yeah? Everything haram has become halal. I am, I have, this is important things I need to say today. Right? But unfortunately, I'm tapped for time, unfortunately. Yeah? Um, I want to just have us think about certain things. Okay? Um, where do we go from here as a community? I think this is very important. Where we go from here, there are a couple of things that we need to do, and I'm going to be very honest about them. The first thing is that we need to re-examine our own lives. Okay? Before we point fingers at other people, look at our own lives. Right? That if he who lives in a glass house should not throw stones. Right? So when you need to look at your own life, how, how, how much rope do I give? Reel it back in. Right? Those things which I know are haram, which are happening, but I'm okay with them, reel it back in. We can't be a society like this. Right? We have to be a society that practices Amr bil ma'roof and nahi anil munkar. That's the first. The second, we need to re-examine who we select to be our leaders. Yeah? We do. Right? And again, who does the blame fall on this? The blame falls on us. Yeah? It does, it falls on us. Yeah? When the people are apathetic, when the people don't want to work, when the people are just sitting on the sidelines and complaining, yeah, then there is going to be someone who comes to power. And eventually those who come to power will be the people we don't like to be in power. But it's our fault. Yeah? You say, oh, they've taken over. Well, well, where were you? Where were you? Right? So we need to re-examine the people who we have as leaders. There is no doubt that there is pockets of leadership within our communities that have been taking us down the path, the path of liberalism to allow things. Let's water it down. Who cares? Yeah? It's okay. Right? And it's our fault for this. Yeah? We have to be honest to ourselves. Don't be afraid to be honest to yourself. Right? But we have to re-examine now who we allow to be our leaders. The third, we have to re-examine who we allow to come sit on these pulpits. Yeah? We have to. Right? There is no doubt, no doubt, we can't be naive. There is a leadership that is extremely liberal, and there is a ulama class which is extremely liberal. Yeah? Intellectuals, we call them. Right? The, if we invite these type of people, and if we have those type of leaders, what kind of community do you think we will be in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years? Yeah? So it is our responsibility, my brothers, that we are very careful about all of these three things, we need to be careful about ourselves. We need to be careful about the type of leaders that we elect. And we need to be careful about the type of ulama that we have. When you look at the life of the Imam salam, right, you find that the Imam salam laid this groundwork for us. Right? That till today, if we are to follow that groundwork, we would remain on the path of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Oh. Allah. Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. You know, even the Imam, you know, I wanted to give examples. There are examples of people who come to the Imam in which they have admitted sin. You know, I wanted to talk about specifically what the responsibility of those who are Amir bil Ma'roof and Nahi bin Munkar. Yeah? Or those people who are doing Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahi anil Munkar. There's a great responsibility for them, right? And there's an understanding. Um, Part of that is you, we have examples from our sixth Imam salam in which people come to him, right, and say, you know, Yabna Rasulillah, unfortunately we engage in this action. Our community does this action. You've not found, I have not found a hadith where the Imam says, you're going to Jahannam, get out from here. Yeah? The Imam never said that. Yeah? The Imam never said to the people, why are you wasting your time in Islam, get out. He didn't say that. The Imam salam looked at them and said, No, that this is not part of the deen of Muhammad. Yeah? That this is not part of our religion. Right? But if you repent, Allah will accept your repentance. This is the beauty of our religion. This is the beauty of what is taught to us by our Imam salam. And it is because of this beauty that the people rush to the side of the Imam. They embrace the madhab of the Ahlul Bayt salam. But it was too much for the Abbasid Caliph Mansur al-Abbasi to handle. It is said that Mansur tried numerous things to harm and hurt the Imam alayhi yeah. 
He just said that until he tried numerous things until the 28th of this month, the Mansur in the year 148 after Hijra sent poisoned grapes to our Imam alayhi salam. It is said that when the Imam alayhi salam had those poisoned grapes immediately, the condition of the body of the Imam began to change. The poison affected his entire body and the color from his face began to change color. It is said in history that before this time, once Mansur sent his servant Muhammad bin Sulaiman to Medina, and he told him that I want you to burn down the house of Sadiq. It is said they came to the house of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. They applied dry wood all around the house of the Imam and they lit it on fire. There were women and children in the house of the Imam alayhi salam. It is said the Imam could be heard and could be seen coming out of his house trying to extinguish that fire. And as he was extinguishing the fire, he would say, Anabnu Muhammadin il Mustafa, Anabnu Ali in il Murtada, Anabnu Fatima al Zahra. Ah, it is said that after the fire was extinguished, for days the Imam would cry in his house. The companions would come. They would say, Ya Rasulillah, why do you still cry? This was not the first time your house or the house of the Ahlul Bayt has been set on fire. For by God, they set the house of Fatima on fire. <laughs> Wa Husayna. The Imam alayhi salam says, Hey, what you say is absolutely true. That they did burn the house of Fatima alayhi salam. That this is not the first time that they burned our house. But I tell you, when that fire was lit, and when I saw the women and children from my house running from one corner to another, my heart went to Karbala. <laughs> My heart went to Karbala and I thought of my Aunt Zainab. <coughs> <coughs> I thought of my Aunt Zainab alayhi salam and how on the day of Ashura, when the Khaimagas were sent on fire, how she ran from one tent to another trying to extinguish them. وَالْآقِبَةٌ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ مَا تَمَيْحُ حُسَيْنَ